It's times like this I always appreciate our cantorial soloist. <laughs> always, always. And I tell her, and I announce it, and I really appreciate it. My hands are killing me. Okay. I should play more often. Or not. So, um, Passover's coming, did you know? Have you heard? This is really important. Passover's coming. My wife has been cleaning our house for the last three weeks. She takes Passover very, very similarly. Maybe not as uh, very seriously. Maybe not quite as serious as Rabbi Bronstein. If you're in the midst of Rabbi Bronstein's Passover work, you know, there's, there's a lot of love and energy and elbow grease in that. It's, it's good, and it's good for us, because there's, there's this message of liberation. And a lot of us Oh, we appreciate this Pesach Seder, this coming together because there's connections and there's memories. And, and I remember people who are no longer at the chairs anymore, folks that are, have been part of my Seder for so long. There's really wonderful things that happen around Passover. And we have this master story. If we have two master stories, one is about creation, one is about liberation. And one thing that I want to share about the liberation master story, because this is the Shabbat before Pesach, so we kind of have to get ourselves, not just our houses together, we have to get ourselves together. We have to look to figure out who we are and where we are going. There's a story that goes on April 8th in 1946, Golda Meir, the Prime Minister of Israel, the first Prime Minister of Israel, but in 1946, she received a telegram from Italy, and it said, we are 100, 1946, we are 110 Jewish refugees, it said. We sailed for Palestine. It was our last hope. Police arrested us on board. We won't leave the ship. We demand permission to continue to Eretz Yisrael, 1946. We demand permission to continue to Eretz Yisrael. Be warned, we will sink the ship if we're not allowed to continue to Palestine because we cannot be more desperate. The next day, Golden Meir wrote about how they went on a hunger strike. And Meir asked them to stop because of all of the harsh conditions on board. And they decided that we would take their place and fast until the ship was allowed to Palestine. That's what she wrote. And on the second day of that hunger strike, every single Jew in Palestine over the age of 13 years old fasted. And, she says, we suddenly felt that we were a single, united people. The third day of the hunger strike was Pesach Eve. Thousands of people were carrying flowers, and they came to Jerusalem to show their support. And the chief rabbis, even then, joined their fast and presided over this unusual Seder and decided that everyone would eat one single piece of matzah, one tiny little piece of matzah, no bigger than an olive. And just a touch, right? And we put out cups of tea rather than the wine for the hunger strikers. And then she shares, we read from the Haggadah, Every generation must see itself as the one that left Egypt. Adonai saved not only our ancestors, but us as well. We repeated these words at Seder every year, but this time they took on new meanings, she wrote. I will never forget my children joining me at the Jewish agency for the Seder, which many have been, which may have been their most important lesson in the suffering of the Jews, the love of Judaism, and the resilience of the Jewish people. The day after the Seder, we were notified that the refugees had been allowed to enter Palestine. So on the first day of Passover, the 101-hour fast ended. Avadim Hayinu, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. But we have lost some of that sense, friends. All of those refugees looking for sanctuary, trying to find a safe place in Palestine. The British is controlling the area. They finally were allowed in, but the folks in Palestine, the Jews, the organizers there, they didn't want them to suffer, so they said, we will take care of that fast. We will do it on your behalf. Such unity. And now the Jewish world seems to argue over everything. Now, arguing is part of our tradition, I get it. But the harshness, where is that compassion for our fellows? 
What about our compassion for those outside of the Jewish community? Avadim Hayinu, we were slaves. It's not that they were slaves in our history, it's us, it's our memory. And if that's really a memory, we have to take that close to us. But I think we've lost some of that sense. I think America's Jews, and this is a hard critique, not of you or of me in particular, but some of the things that we're facing, I think we forget. We forget that we were once slaves too. And it's so easy to fall into the trap of the carpool, that that's the most important thing we have to do. Now it's important. I forgot them once, just once. It's important. But how much more is there to do in our world? You know, there's a book, and all you need to think about is the title of it. And I share this all of the time. It was a sociological study of the American Jewish community. And the book is called When Jews Became White Folk. We always saw ourselves with a, with a distinctiveness, not better, not this idea of chosenness that puts us on top. Of course not. But we have a distinct history, a unique perspective, but so often, especially in a place like America, it's kind of easy to pass. And we forget that we were once the slaves too, because we've come along, and we've come a long way. There's another text from our Haggadah that says, Ha lachma anya. This is the bread of the affliction, the bread of poverty that our ancestors ate in the land of Egypt. And then it says, Kol dikhfin let all who are hungry come and eat. And then it says, the next line, Kol vivsach. Let all who are in need come and share this Pesach meal. And there's a famous Orthodox scholar, Rabbi Soloveitchik, and he said they sound alike, but they're different. Let all who are hungry, kol dikhfin, refers to somebody without any food. But the second line, let all who are in need, kol ditzuich, it's different. Those who are in need, but not in need of bread. They have bread. They have matzah, they have wine, but maybe they don't have a home. Or maybe they don't have family. Or maybe they're not feeling love. Maybe there's a sense of loneliness. Halachma anya, the bread of our affliction, it's our renewal of a pledge. A renewal of a pledge to reach out to others, not only to focus on ourselves. It's a time of solidarity and a time of sharing. It's a time of responsibility. And if we do not, and if we don't really take this seriously, if we do not take that seriously and remember our slavery, then what's our Seder really about? What are we doing there if not to remember that we kind of got out and we found a little safety and security hopefully a little love and happiness. Now, I've been posting on our Facebook page uh, for the synagogue all of these little Haggadah supplements about different justice issues and things that are going around about hunger and world hunger and empowerment and women. All of these things remind us where we have been in Egypt and where do we need to go, which is a place of a taste of that world to come, that messianic era where there's peace and harmony for all. But because we are taught that all of humanity is created, B'Tselem Elohim, remember, the first Jews are Abraham and Sarah, not Adam and Eve. We go back to the same source, so nobody is better than one another. And if we believe that we're created in B'Tselem Elohim, in this divine image, then that changes how we're supposed to look at everybody else. It's kind of a radical concept that all of us have the same value without exception. There are no exceptions. God did not divide creation between the rich and the poor. God did not divide creation between those who can afford homes and those who cannot, between those who are entitled to health care and those who are not. God created us all endowed with equal rights and charged us with the responsibility to be partners and try and heal a broken world. We're taught that every single human life has no equivalent. And if you save a life, it's as if you save the world. We like to say that, but sometimes we forget what we mean. And I think that's true for a lot of us, this sin of forgetting. Because it's easy. 
and we get busy, and we get distracted, myself too. But I want to read something to you that I saw earlier today that I found really moving. It's kind of poignant to see all of these teenagers in our youth movement in NIFTY, the North American Federation of Temple Youth. It's a really long name, but it's NIFTY is what we call it. Now our kids in the synagogue are part of this, and so many are traveling today to Washington, D.C., And our own kids, my own kids, lots of folks from here are moving tomorrow to, not moving, they're not moving, they're staying in your homes, don't worry, but they're going to Denver tomorrow. And some of us rabbis are really struggling with this, this march for our lives because it's Shabbat and how do you observe, but we also have this teaching when Heschel was, it was a Sunday, but while Heschel was walking and marching in Selma, that, you know, he felt like his feet were praying. What a powerful idea. So our kids are going to feel like their feet are praying, and for some of them, that is going to be their prayers. Try and figure out how to respond with their own voices and their own legs to tragedies that they are feeling. So Rabbi Brad Boxman, a rabbi I have known for a long, long time, he's been in Parkland. And this is what he wrote today on reformjudaism.org, the reform movement's blog. He says, a small but mighty group of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas high school students, many of whom are members of Congregation Kol Tikva, his synagogue, has grown by hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of like-minded youth around the world and especially throughout our country. Over a million students walked out of school in protest on the one-month anniversary of the shooting, an unprecedented event in the history of protest and civil disobedience in our country. The March for Our Lives, begun here in Parkland now, will now result in millions marching in more than 800 locations worldwide tomorrow. Out of the few came the many. What others thought impossible has ignited a movement. The prophet Isaiah, he wrote, Imagined a world in which things once thought impossible can yet come true. He imagined a day on which the lion will lay down with the lamb, when the wolf will cohabit peacefully with the sheep, and the calf will play with the leopard, and a young child will lead them. And today, our children, our children are leading the way. They are tearing down the walls of apathy and cynicism, Broxman wrote. They are parting the waters of self-absorbed egocentrism and jaded nothing-will-ever-changeness and replacing them with a call to justice, common-sense gun legislation, and the preservation of life. Friends, we know what it's like to be a stranger in a strange land. We know what it's like to feel vulnerable. That's not something we can forget. Pesach says that everybody needs to be treated with dignity because we reached freedom after degradation and oppression. Our tradition is teaching us that we cannot stand idly by the blood of our neighbors the way so many over centuries and centuries have stood idly by by our people's blood. So what do we do? How do we respond I'm going to be here for morning in the minion in the morning. I'm going to join my family in an orange t-shirt in the afternoon in Denver. Maybe I'll see some of you. I have a feeling I might. I know this town a little bit better now. But if Pesach is going to be that family celebration, what is it that we're really celebrating? Where are we going on our march out of Egypt? If we end up in Egypt every year, we have to know the direction towards a promised land. I believe the promised land is ultimately going to be where we take care of one another. It's not that hard, but it seems to be the hardest thing that humanity has ever experienced. So here's to our strength and prayers for some resilience and looking forward to meeting and conversations and talking with other people who don't always agree with one another to try and find a way to help our kids feel a little safer just by growing up. Let's turn to the Siddur, page 